Hello, everyone, and welcome to this session of the Crypto Policy Symposium. Um, this is a conference to encourage critical discourse um, around cryptocurrency and understand the kind of more niche and interesting um, stories um, in this space um, with the uh, intention and idea of, you know, um, informing and, and um, uh, guiding and, and, you know, providing the necessary tools to um, properly legislate. Um, so I'm Sebastian, um, uh, Sebastian Jones. I'm a journalist at Tortoise Media, um, where I focus on um, corruption, government corruption, cryptocurrency, and um, tech. Um, and I'm delighted to be joined by doc uh, Dr. Nick Weaver um, from the um, uh, International Computer Science Institute of Berkeley in Berkeley, um, and Professor Roxanne Murashi, um, who is a professor of education at San Jose um, State University. And so thank you. Thank you both very much for being here. Um, and today, the uh, in this session, the, we're focusing on crypto, blockchain, and education, and the links there, and um, what I think is a very interesting dilemma that is emerging, and I'm hoping to get to the bottom of um, to inform kind of any reporting that I do in the future in this space. Um, so yeah, just just as a little bit of background, it seems no matter where you're coming from, it seems like everyone has a, at least some kind of understanding of crypto. Um, and my colleague um, um, at Tortoise, Luke, and I have been doing a lot of reporting around this and organizing, convening lots of discussions. Um, and we've spoken to all sorts of people from uh, proper crypto bros in Miami sitting in their apartments um, with kind of red solo cups in the back talking about how delighted they are to be, you know, borrowing lots lots of money um, using different tokens and buying tokens and selling tokens and just raising incredible amounts of money to enjoy a lavish lifestyle in Miami to people more like Stephen Deal, um, who has has done a lot to convene um, today and, and, and this conference, um, who presents some more kind of worrying facts on the other side that it's not all just kind of glam free money and, and celebration. And actually, there is um, some pretty serious issues um, at hand. And and in this session, I hope we'll kind of get to the bottom of, of, of a very interesting link between education and cryptocurrency, um, which I hopefully by the end of this will fully understand along with you. Um, and yeah, I'd like to go first um, to Dr. Nick Weaver, who can provide kind of an outline, um, I hope, of this dilemma um, and this question and, and um, allow us to kind of understand exactly what's going on. So Nick, if you kind of outline what the problem is here and, and what we should expect from, you know, this discussion in this space, that would be... That would be fantastic. Well, there's really two separate problems here. There's the problem at the university level, which is what I'll be talking about. And then there's the problem in the K through 12 level, which uh, Dr. Mar <laughs> Dr. Marashini, Mar sorry, uh, uh, is going to be talking about. Uh, my tongue just flies up. So, at the university level, there's um, something that you need to understand is that as a researcher, professor, you work on problems that tend to interest you. And there are a lot of interesting problems in the cryptocurrency space. The technology may be so garbage, I would only teach it to mock it in the general security class, but Within the space, there are some cool things like improved zero knowledge proofs, uh, faster Byzantine consensus algorithms, stuff like that, that's really actually kind of fun to work on. But there's two important things. As a professor or researcher, you don't work for free. You need some funder who's willing to provide resources to do your research. And uh, you also, though, at the same time, have a huge amount of independence. So if I'm at a university and can get $10 million of funding to create the Center for Applied Computational Demonology, I'll be able to do that. And there'll be the University of California Berkeley Applied Computational Center for Demonology if I was at Berkeley. Um, and so... This creates um, a set of incentives that basically mean, with very rare exception, the blockchain and cryptocurrency side at any given university is filled of believers with an economic interest in it. 
The only real exception is those like me who've been focused on criminality and bad things happening because the space of bad things and measuring bad things is basically an unlimited mine of comedy gold in the cryptocurrency space. So I've had a business model that actually allowed me to, as a skeptic, follow the space closely as a researcher. But almost nobody has that luxury. So within the computer science department, you basically have two camps. You have a small group that is interested in the cryptocurrency space because they're effectively invested in the cryptocurrency space. So your startup might be, say, privacy-preserving machine learning on the blockchain, complete with the token. If you're that professor, you're going to be very pro-cryptocurrency. And then pretty much everybody else just doesn't care about the space because it seems so buzzwordy and gobbledygook. And then when you look at it, they there's really very little there once you scratch the surface. And similarly, the funding tends to be mostly private um, because the, the NSF funding and stuff like that will fund the build better systems, measure how things are bad, et cetera. But it's not enough to create these centers that whenever you get a center like that, it is almost always seeded with a significant amount of private funding. And in the cryptocurrency space, it's almost always those who are interested in the outcome. There's one other phenomenon, and that is cryptocurrency-centric classes, classes on blockchain, decentralized government, et cetera, et cetera. These tend to actually fall into two camps. Camp number one is the continuing education master's type classes. And these are basically profit centers for the university so and the department. So like the uh, University of Berkeley, our tuition is um, like 12,000 a year for a normal student, but can be 50,000 a year for a professional master's student. And so classes for that target audience are going to be very hype driven and hype cycle driven because that's what the students coming in want to take. And then there are the classes that are aimed at our normal students. And this is usually basically a class of, or a bit of engineering. And I don't mean engineering systems, I mean social engineering. So faculty members have to teach so much per year to maintain their status and part of their job. And so if you can create your own class for blockchain technology and staff it full of guest lecturers um, and get 200, 300 students, this gets you out of your teaching requirements. Um, and so that's what the um, classes that are targeting undergrads and, um, and uh, normal graduate students generally are, is basically uh, social engineering on the part of faculty to get out of actually having to teach a real class. Um, mm. And I've had some students uh, take a couple of those classes and they went about as well as you'd expect. Um, they tend to be very hype centric and that when you actually try to get into the meat of it, it actually doesn't end up working out very well. Like trying to have business students write smart contracts. So we want business students with no programming experience to write in a programming language that makes JavaScript look sane and they have to write bug-free code. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm interested. Sorry to, sorry to interrupt. I'm just on the surface level. Um, it seems like there's nothing. You could argue there's nothing kind of profoundly or seriously wrong with, you know, uh, a company with interests in people learning about cryptocurrency funding a department where people go and just gain kind of 
objective information and then, and then they can make up their own minds about cryptocurrency. You know, so if students are studying it just for the sake of learning and the university is offering it and teaching it, it seems at kind of the most basic level, like there's nothing particularly wrong there. I'm curious at what point this kind of differs from other classes and other departments and, and kind of becomes something that we should look out for or kind of be interested in um, as, as journalists or members of the public or legislators. Um, there's a couple of things. First of all, it's um, symptomatic of um, how universities seek out funding um, and attempts to get large amounts of money are always going to be things you're going to ha have questions about, et cetera. Um, and the other thing is, is a lot of the crypto centers and the like are used for reputation washing. So um, they're used to go, see, University X has a blockchain center. That means blockchain technology must be some sort of revolution, not the fact that you give me 10 million bucks and I could have the Center for Applied Computational Demonology and Gratuitous Astrology formed. Um, so there's a bit of reputation washing going on. Um, the other thing is, is I think it's slightly corrupting when you have faculty teaching stuff where they not only have a economic interest in, but their economic interest in it basically derives from hype. So if you're a um, professor working on computer-aided design tools and you found a CAD company, cool. Having students hyped to throw money at your sector as investors doesn't make sense. Um, but the cryptocurrency space at heart is a self-assembled Ponzi scheme. There's basically the only money that comes out is what other people invest into it because there's no dividends, there's no interest payments and the like. And so the worry I have is if a faculty member literally has privacy preserving machine learning on the blockchain as their startup, they have token in their startup that they've sold to retail investors um, as an unregistered security, um, that having them try to teach a class that's designed to increase hype in the very sector where their fortune depends on getting others to put their money in and for others to lose their money is problematic to me. But then again, I'm not money motivated, so I don't understand why somebody would do that. That's interesting. And do we see phenomenons like this across other departments, or is this something truly unique to the kind of crypto space? I think it's truly unique to the crypto space because of the nature of public participation, that if you're a Mackie prof and you have your startup as well, your startup, you're concerned with making something that will work, that people will buy, and you will get the results of. But if you're a CS prof with interest in a cryptocurrency, your only interest in that cryptocurrency is getting people to buy that cryptocurrency itself. Um, and so there's a very different set of, not incentives, but outcomes that your outcome as a eek or as a uh in a mech e prof is to make something physical that somebody will actually gain utility out of while with a cryptocurrency it's you try to find new bag holders that's interesting I i'm keen to um at a later point in this discussion move on to kind of next steps well what do we do how do we deal with this um what should regulators be thinking? What should journalists be doing? But before that, I would be interested to ask you, Roxana, to um, give us your, your presentation and, and help us, yeah, yeah, basically explain the kind of issue you, you were explaining in the K to 12 and, and um, other forms of education. 
Thank um, you so much. Yeah. So I'll, I'll begin by saying that I am a professor at San Jose State University, and I have to also do the disclaimer that my views today are not do not necessarily represent my university. Um, and also, and I'm not I don't receive any funding um, in any way for, for this work. Um, so um, big picture, what I'm going to be talking about is I'm, I'm concerned about the privatization of our public systems and the social impact space where many of these uh, impact projects are using blockchain digital id systems at the back end with a lot of people unaware of what they are what the harms are and that when in the cryptocurrency space they talk about digital wallets right now i'm seeing a lot of proposals that are talking about putting children's educational health financial information on digital wallets and so this is sort of that's the sort of the big picture umbrella um, look i'm going to share some slides i'm going to go quickly through them because there are a lot um, and then I will provide this slide deck as well as a um, publicly for folks. Um, hopefully folks can see this. This around here. Okay. So tokenizing toddlers, cradle to career behavioral tracking on blockchain, Web3, and the Internet of Education. So I want to start with a reality check about blockchain. A couple months ago, over 1,500 technologists and computer scientists wrote a letter to Congress documenting the very serious problems with blockchain. Um, I'll have the link there, concerns.tech, it's probably been discussed at some of the other sessions. A few years ago, ever since that blockchain became, became more popularized, there's been a lot of um, digging into it and actually saying, is there anything there? No, it's actually, there's a lot of problems. And so this is from a few years ago, and I've um, asked other colleagues with expertise in blockchain, are you seeing some positive use cases? And it, it's very rare to see, and, and it looks like there's just a lot of problems in this blockchain space. However, it is rapidly, rapidly rolling out in education, but in very silent ways. So how is it entering into education and public services? through what's called the social impact sector. So um, with social impact bonds, social impact initiatives and projects, many of these are gonna be on what's called smart contracts. They're uh, gonna be using blockchain at the back end as the, um, to be able to provide the trigger payment to the investors. This is going to essentially tokenize the data into profits for investors. It's been a bit written about this um, around this Wall Streetification of education public services, a policy piece in the National Education Policy Center around how this is entering into education. And so big picture, what it is, is there's, um, they identify what's a problem, what's a need in the community, a nonprofit has a solution. Government obviously wants to pay for something that works, right and with strict of funding up until now right and and so there isn't research arms within the our public systems anymore the ngo does its work investors so an external investor will front the money bring it in there will be an intermediary that will um kind of manage the whole project an independent evaluator not bound to university or you know public entity rules about data collection does the um, evaluation if metrics are paid it's called pay for success then the in investor gets the money back from the government and they get a return on investment so they can actually profit with the claim that they've saved the government money because this this um, initiative is somehow more efficient um, again, the concern is that these uh, contracts would be on um, on blockchain. There's false promises that they're reliable, secure, they're not. And the big concern that many people have is that the data are undeletable. You can never delete data. And so it's one thing to have blockchain following products on a supply chain and saying, did this product get from point A to point B? But when you're tracking children and you can never delete false data from those early years, it's extremely problematic. What's this gonna look like in education? Here's um, a couple of ways it's coming in. Authentication of degree. Some of these sound reasonable, right? But this is how they get you. They get some reasonable need and then they tether it to some predatory, um, possibilities behind it that, that are problematic. And so the reasonable need is maybe authentication to degrees and certificates, identity verification. But then we're also seeing it come into the gaming and digital labor space. Payments via cryptocurrency are now starting to show up. And this is sort of the cradle to career um, slide from a, um, a, a blockchain enthusiast. His name is uh, Greg Nadal. 
I found a colleague had sent me this about Web 3.0, Education 3.0, the Internet of Education. It's quite involved. Big picture is they want to connect um, from the time a kid is born, health data, digital data, educational data. It's saying here they're going to transfer it to a public wallet when the child turns 18, which implies that it's on a public blockchain before that. What protections are there? None that I know of. And then there's this um, career emphasis. So right now, um, I called the author of that um, that slide deck and spoke with him a couple of days ago. He says it's early stages. There's 14 states piloting these things through this workforce innovation network of the National Governors Association. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce also has a similar kind of a um, language around learning and employment records again it's going to be skills based badges and again you can see on these kinds of initiatives that they are promoting ai based blockchain based decentralized public private um, and for seamless sharing of data through a person's education and career pathways what's going to look like in public services here is a um, investment review publication around human capital performance bonds and again these areas of need early childhood learning, workforce training, post-incarceration programs, et cetera. Big picture is this, here's how the money works. It's gonna end up creating these markets where investors can come into our public systems and profit off of our public systems. And it's a guaranteed profit because it's pay for success. They set the metrics to be really easy to be successful and then they get the trigger payment or they say, oh, well, we know this is gonna fail and they can short. And so it's it's extremely troubling to then see that the US Department of Education is piloting, is considering putting children's records on blockchain based solutions to simplify data sharing. It's also not just the US, it's it's a global situation. Blockchain for social impact. I encourage folks to look at this this website. Again, the social impact space, right? Privatizing through the back door. And so here's the, this is the UN Sustainable Development Goals, financial inclusion. I know some of the themes in the other sessions have been about predatory inclusion, identity and vulnerable populations, education, and here we are. What do we do? They want to promote the creation of Ethereum blockchain solutions across a number of sectors. This is just some screenshots from that page. You see the popular NFTs and a decentralized future and dozens of organizations involved. What does this have to do with tokenizing toddlers? Some of the universal pre-K legislation that I've seen roll out um, would allow right now without any regulations would allow these play based surveillance of toddlers linked to digital ID. So here's just a screenshot from a colleague's research on um, some of these and early uh, research initiatives that are using some of these um, apps, uh, Lena is one of these literacy measures like the, the language spoken in a child's home. Um, and then this is connected to um, digital IDs and it's, it's very concerning. And here you can see similar to kind of Facebook's psychometrics, they're doing this now with children and these little badges and um, trying to predict their futures. Again, I think we have to ask questions about data systems that are rolling out. California has a cradle to career data system that currently I see a lot of hints in the language to where it would be connected to these blockchain based systems. We have to ask critical questions about these three major policy trends. It's privatization of public services. It's a capture of our democracy. It's privatization of evaluation research. So you no longer have evaluation research that could be scrutinized in a public agency. It's a nonprofit doing the evaluation research where they're not even bound by ethical protections for, for the participants. And then the, this own your own data narrative of the folks in the Web3 blockchain space who are trying to sell this and say this is a solution for all these privacy woes. Um, we just have to pay attention to that as a potential um, uh, problem. Democracy, dollars, and data at the root. Um, I'm also active with the NAACP, leading civil rights organization in the U.S. There are several data justice resolutions in 2019. We did publish one opposing the use of blockchain digital ID systems for public services and education. So a lot of the narratives that this is going to be, you know, helping or supporting communities of color can be um, 
um, undone with that. And then, uh, or I guess addressed, like the, the, the community is aware of these things and the predatory nature of, of those blockchain systems. Finally, some policy recommendations. I think it's really important that we ensure that there's full informed consent with any the use of any of these systems regarding the risks and harms of data exploitation, especially because they're new. We need legislative protections against the data sharing with the use of these systems and wallets right now there's nothing and it's just a free for all. We need a critical review and vetting of the data system vulnerabilities before these issues, these systems are launched and not after the fact. And then we have to also close the FERPA and HIPAA loopholes um, that exist right now that allow for what I call an epic data heist that it's uh, pub private entities partnering with public entities and have given being given the permission to take whatever data they want and only having a pinky promise that they wouldn't. Woo. And then this is it. Just at the end, you know, you're going to see these these ads that you you'll own your own data and, and don't let big tech take your data. Well, yeah, big tech's taking the data. We have to protect against that. But blockchain is not an answer because not only you'll own your own data, the rest of it's going to be on a public blockchain. Rest of the world's going to own your own data as well. So that's sort of my my closing. And I'm glad to connect more. Um, and answer any questions. Thank you. Did I do it in time? Is that did yeah. that make the ten minutes? It was quick. That was I mean, that was great. Thirty some. Yeah. 30 Thank you very slides much. And how, okay. <laughs> do we have that was, time that was to talk? Yeah, that was very very concise to the point. That was uh, extremely interesting Thank as you. well. Um, and I think I think a big takeaway for me there was the you know this kind of trend we're seeing across in the UK and and it seems like in the states of the kind of defunding and and collapse of public institutions and you know investors um you know preying on it preying on these public services almost as if they're like like vultures uh looking to kind of Absolutely. generate money out of um the, the remains of public services but i'm i'm interested to go to um nick on this and to hear your thoughts and how how the information there um you know, the meshes with uh, the research you've been doing and what you've been seeing in higher education. So Roxana's uh, stuff focuses on what is actually a larger problem than what I see at the university level. So um, the privatization of uh, government issues is a big one. And I have to say, at least in the US, we haven't privatized our sewer systems and told them to dump raw sewage into the sea. Um, so there's that. Um, but one thing that really strikes me from um, Roxana's presentation is how much the blockchain stuff is used to obscure what is really going on. That um, that a blockchain is just an append-only ledger. It's a way to write data that you can only add stuff to it. Think of it as a giant roll of toilet paper that you write stuff on. Um, that can't be a technological revolution, but it creates this air of male bovine excrement over everything that causes people to not ask what is really going on. And then when you ask what is really going on, they want to do things like crack you, tra cr cradle to career is really cradle to grave because you rest when you're dead. Um, and um, all the data. And yet at the same time, they use the blockchain buzzword without understanding what the problems are, even in constructing a cradle to grave data trace for somebody because it's a question of data formats of data formatting data access control um there's data about you that um you don't want other people to access there is data about you that you want to be able to update there's other poor pieces of data about you that we do not want you to be able to update unless there's an error. In that case, you need a mechanism to correct errors. Oh, wait, append only data. And in many ways, I find the infestation of the blockchain meme into the K through 12 system far more disturbing than at the university level. Because at the university level, we're just talking about a some few million bucks for centers that act to 
greenwash the uh, industry and a few professors who get out of teaching classes. Mm -hmm. uh, but the use of this as basically part of the justification for um, larger distortions in the, the uh, primary school education worries me a lot more. Interesting. Uh, I'm curious to just follow that up with a quick question of, it seems like the space of cryptocurrency is, is so kind of convoluted and confusing and, and the, how, how kind of complicated it is is often used to pretend it's something greater than what, what you're kind of suggesting it is. Um, do you think there is a space and a, and a need for education around cryptocurrency or should it kind of be cast out and, and we shouldn't waste any kind of time on it? Do you, do you think people should be learning about cryptocurrency? Um, maybe Roxana first. Absolutely. I think that they I think there needs to be greater public awareness about the connection, like what what cryptocurrency is, the 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 fact that it is rooted in blockchain um, technology and the way that blockchain is already rolling out in all of these other systems. But the, the, some of the challenge that I've had in sharing about this in higher education, especially around the education and protection of children space, is that it does seem really big and complicated and no one wants to touch it. But I've seen that the language is also like what Nick said, the language is obscured in the way these things are brought in. What I'm hearing is marketing where it's being pitched as being in the name of equity and access, being in the name of justice. We all want justice and equity and access and these positive sounding you know, initiatives. The entire social impact space is about doing right by the world, doing social good, tech for good, social impact for good. That's the language. And so then it becomes very difficult to be someone who's asking critical questions about this because then it becomes, well, don't you want what's good for the world? Like, why, why, why are you against, you know, justice? And, and so it becomes almost like a psychological twisted word swap that is makes it difficult. I call it double speak. Um, Silicon Solutions and DoubleSpeak, I did a, a talk on that on philanthropic capitalism. And the other part that Nick had mentioned as well is that it's external funding coming in where they are not necessarily like philanthropies that provide these gifts and foundations. They've, they're they also connected to a lot of them, tech media, tech rooted um, companies. There's a profit in their giving. It's not just a gift. It actually, there's a, they can profit by ensuring that those gifts go to the ed tech programs that are being piloted, that then their companies profit from. So it's, it's once you see the, the roots, it's, it's, it's quite troubling. That was a long winded answer to your very yeah. good question. <laughs> I'd like to, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this as well, Nick. Is there a space in higher education for studying the blockchain or is this, yes. you know, should, should this be so, resigned? So, uh, I taught at Berkeley for a long time. Um, I rage quit last semester. They don't treat lecturers all that well. And so I'm glad to be out of that job for now. But, um, but uh, there's sort of several aspects. One thing that we do very poorly is proper financial education. Mm -hmm. That partially why I've been able to see through so much of the cryptocurrency uh, bovine excrement is I have a fairly strong self-taught economics background, enough to be past the Dunning-Kruger threshold and enough to know I can't beat the market, so I only invest in index funds. Um, so first of all, there's a lot of financial literacy that really needs to be improved, that um, basically pretty much everybody should understand you can't beat the market, the market's only positive sum on a long-term, short-term trading is gambling and, and the like. Um, and that's something that once you get, then the, you see that the cryptocurrency space is garbage and a self-assembled Ponzi scheme, that economically there's nothing there. Um, the tech side um, should be taught in computer science. I do in the computer security class a, um, one hour and change lecture on um, cryptocurrency and blockchain, mostly so people understand what's new, very little, what isn't a lot, what the problems are, 
extensive. And I call it actually an intellectual vaccination. So I don't have uh, students thinking that this Web3 startup is going to be a long-term viable business. Um, and then there's the research side. And the research side, there's a lot of cool research that gets done. Um, the work on much more efficient on interactive zero knowledge proofs is cool. The idea that you can prove X without revealing it. So you can prove that you deposit it into this uh, pool of dirty money and therefore you are withdrawing your deposit that you, but you can't uh, link the deposit and withdrawal. That's some really cool cryptographic games. Mm. Um, that it's pretty much only used for money laundering. He had details, details. Um, <laughs> apart from that, Mrs. Lincoln, how was the play? Um, Interesting. And yeah. there's other similar tech stuff. And so there's a lot there that makes for interesting papers, makes for least publishable units, allows you to get your tenure, stuff like that. And also there's a lot on the study of online criminality um, that, this is an area that has been good for me personally. That's been a focus of my research for over a decade. And the cryptocurrency space is, how shall we put a target rich environment for that area of research? So there is a place in higher education for this. It just should be a lot more skeptical than the yeah. Centers for Applied Demonology uh, seem to uh, promoted as that's interesting we just have we just have a few minutes left um and as as a as a journalist you know we're kind of always looking for specific stories that we can tell um that would make make these kind of issues relevant to a bigger audience and, and to kind of you know regular people and i was wondering if either of you or, or both of you had kind of a specific instance or a specific case study that you could quickly run through that kind of represents the nefarious influence of um, the crypto, the crypto world on education of any form. Um, I don't have a specific ex um, example, but I do think that I do have some something to say about the um, the common themes across what I'm seeing with the, the crypto space and other things that, that I've studied related to education that actually intersect some of the, the um, organizations that are doing this work. So there's a mismatch in the hype, in the marketing, in the reality. A lot of my early research was in violence prevention programs. So I did evaluations of the effectiveness of, of some of these programs. And I noticed that the, a lot of the most, the were not effective programs had beautiful websites. They were really well done. They were marketing well, the, the, the schools were, you know, picking them up and doing it. But then, so there was a mismatch, like some of the best looking programs were actually not effective, might actually have been problematic, right? And then I saw that same thing happening with the influx of educational technology into classrooms, where there was a lot of hype and there's been this has been published about how the, the research is shoddy in these things they say it's research backed. They say it's evidence based and then you actually look and it's not. But again, the marketing is pushing it as proven effective. And so I see that in the same way the charter school sector, the privatization of public education is the same. There's a ton of fraud in the in the sector. There's a lot of schools closing. But again, it's hyped as the solution, as better than. And so I see the blockchain crypto web space. It's the privatization of the financial sector for one thing, right? It's a it's an unregulated. So I just see those those parallels are really important and then if there might be an analysis of the mismatch between the marketing and the hype i do have a specific example actually there's a an ed tech um uh, program in detroit it was called buzz where they had um a lot of funding to pilot it it ended up there was an investigative report published by the aclu where it was it was broken it was problematic and everything and then meanwhile a tech funded philanthropic funded you know digital promise or you know one of these organizations had published it as a success top 100 schools to visit this is something good and so i see that same thing happening when i'm looking at the blockchain space where um on the one hand the experts and the computer scientists are saying this is not what you want this is harmful this is problematic meanwhile it's being marketed as you know the next innovation that's interesting. Um, thank you for that. Nick, do you have any final thoughts or, or, or response to that? 
one thing that I think is a larger story that has been missed is the growing dependence of uh, public universities and departments on revenue earning programs. So I mentioned that the masters for um, the masters for uh, professional masters that'll cost fifty thousand dollars a year plus. Um, many departments at major universities are dependent on these programs because they don't get enough funding from tuition or the state. Um, and it can be remarkably little. So um, there's a program at Berkeley that seems to net the department about, oh, $4,000, $5,000 per student per year, but is costing the students fifty dollars to $60,000. But they need to do that because that limited amount of revenue is necessary for hiring enough TAs to teach the normal classes they're supposed to teach. That's great. Yeah, thank you very much. And I think I think we're qu quickly approaching the end of this session. Um, it's gone by unbelievably quickly, but it's been very interesting. I think there's a lot of things here to kind of continue looking into from a you know journalism journalistic perspective and and I think also you know policy making perspective um, I think the real takeaways for me are you know the privatization of public systems and the issues there we have to really watch as public services and public systems like higher education are defunded and, and kind of the need to fund them results in some pretty shady deals and you know we need to look at the interests of, of the kind of funding bodies funding them and then also I think that maybe there is a space for um, education around cryptocurrency, especially um, to demystify it and, and ensure that, you know, the c confusing nature isn't just being used to market it to people who are none the wiser. Uh, um, but I think, uh, you know, again, it's very important to look at who's funding these uh, programs, um, where the interest is, and, um, you know, especially in my position, you know, dig, dig deep into where the money's coming from. Um, so I, yeah, I'd like to thank you both very much. And um, I hope everyone watching enjoys the rest of the sessions. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Thank you.